A quick announcement. I wanted to remind you that yesterday you would have received a PDF file of your graded exam. So take a look at the exam and if you have any questions about the grading, you should print out the entire exam and take it to you, with you to discussion, all right? And talk to your TA about it. If you do think there is an error, then what you need to do is print out a copy of the exam, attach a note explaining to me what the problem is, and you need to hand it to me, not the TAs, all right? So all regrades have to be turned into me. Please do not send me an email because as, as you know, when it's a class of this size, it's just I can't be inundated with PDF files and it's difficult for me to keep track of who sent what. So that's why I'm asking you to print it out, attach a note, and then turn it into me. And the deadline is two weeks from yesterday because it's two weeks from the date when you received the PDF files from me, okay? And so within that deadline, if you turn it in, then we will take a look at it, okay? Is that clear to everybody? So please do not send me an email, all right? You can hand it to me after class or you can hand it to me before class. You can hand it to me um, during my office hours. And if I'm not there, you can even slide it under my door, okay? As long as I get it within the two week deadline. Is that clear to everybody? Okay, so if you guys remember, we're looking at acid-based titrations and we said we're gonna look at three types of acid-based titrations, strong acid, strong base, or vice versa. We looked at weak acid, strong base. Now we're gonna look at the third scenario where you have a weak base versus a strong acid. So if you look at the titration, you can see that the weak base is placed in the Erlenmeyer flask. And that is typically in an analysis, that is the one that has the unknown concentration. We place the strong acid in the burette. And when you start the titration now, we want to look at what the reaction would be. Remember we said that if you have an acid and a base, they can't coexist. Large amounts of acids and bases do not coexist. They will react to give you water and salt, okay? So let's see what happens here. So if we write the complete ionic equation, And we'll start with the strong acid. A strong acid we know dissociates completely. So in reality when it's dissolved in water, you have hydronium ion and chloride ion. So that's the strong acid. Now we have the weak base. We know weak bases do not dissociate, do not react with water. They're, they tend to be undissociated, all right? Or in this case, they would not pick up a proton because it's a weak base. We know that when, it, when we see the word weak, it means its preference is to remain the way it is, okay? So this, this is what we have at the start. Now we're gonna let it go to products. Now this is the base, this is the acid. We know they're gonna react to give me NH4 plus aqueous plus water plus Cl minus aqueous, all right? And so what you end up with is this strong acid and the weak base will give you its conjugate acid and water, okay? And if you look at this, chloride ions are there at the beginning, chloride ions are there at the end, so the chloride ions are the spectator ions. So we have only one spectator ion here, <clears throat> which is the chloride ion. Now, <clears throat> if you write the net ionic equation, now we take away the spectator ions, so, because remember the spectator ions don't participate in the reaction, they're just there. And so if I write the net ionic equation, what I end up with is the hydronium ion plus ammonia, which is the acid and the base will react to give me water, NH4+, which is the conjugate acid, and water. 
All right, so this is the acid, this is the base. The acid will donate a proton to the base so that you end up with NH4 plus and water. So this is the neutralization, all right? And, and so if we look at this, if all of this reacted completely with this at the equivalence point, at the stoichiometric point, what you'd have is water. Water is neutral plus you have NH4 plus. So now look at NH4 plus. NH4 plus is the conjugate acid of a weak base which is NH3. So if you take NH4 plus, would you expect it to be acidic, basic or neutral? Acidic, all right? So we know that the equivalence point now, the pH has to be acidic, all right? And then if you write the, uh, the overall reaction or the general form of the reaction, it will be um, where you have HCl, which is the strong acid, reacting with ammonia, which is the weak base, giving you NH4 plus. Um, in fact, I'm writing the general form of the reaction, so it did just turn out to be giving you salt here. All right? So if you write it in the general form, you see that what you're forming is ammonium chloride. You're forming the salt. The strong acid reacts with the base. So can everybody see that the general form or the overall reaction or sometimes they call this the molecular equation, all right, where it identifies the molecules. Here these are covalent compounds, so you can use the word molecular, all right, and this is also called the molecular equation, okay? So now let's look at what the pH titration curve looks like. So this is what the titration curve looks like. So over here, we're measuring the pH on this side. On the y-axis, we have the, the pH of the analyte. Over here, we have the volume of the strong acid that's added. And you can see now the shape of this is very different, okay? To begin with, you would just have a weak base, all right? Before we add any strong acid, we have only a weak base in the flask, so we'd expect the pH to be high. All right, it's, it's a basic solution. Now as you add a strong acid and you're neutralizing the weak base and converting it to NH4+, which is a weak acid, you know that the pH is going to go down, okay? So what we see is that the pH decreases, but in this region, this is the buffer region, all right? Once again, over here in this region here, it would act as a buffer, so that's why it flattens out. It doesn't, the pH doesn't change dramatically there. It just kind of flattens out and plateaus because now what we have is in that, mix, in that solution, you'll have NH3, which is the weak base, and you're going to have NH4+, plus, which is its conjugate acid, and you're having mixtures of both in substantial amounts. And so in that region, it's going to act as a buffer, all right? So that's where this flattens out. And then as you add more and more acid, now your buffer is going to get completely swamped and everything is going to get converted to NH4+. So at the equivalence point now, you can see all I have is NH4+, Cl- and water. Cl- is the conjugate base of a strong acid. We know that's neutral. So Cl- is neutral. Water is neutral, all right? And therefore, the only other species you have in there is NH4+, and the NH4 plus is the conjugate acid of a weak base, it's going to be acidic and therefore the pH is less than 7, all right? So you can see that the pH is less than 7, okay? Beyond this point, now you're swamped with a strong acid. So beyond the equivalence point, the pH is going to be determined by the extra hydrochloric acid that's there which dissociates completely and you can see beyond the equivalence point, now rapidly the solution gets very acidic, all right? Now if this is the equivalence point, so you can see that in this titration um, the concentrations are different, okay? In this titration it turns out that the equivalence point is at 50 milliliters, all right? So half the equivalent point would be 25. So if you take 25 milliliters that will correspond to that. And so at 25 milliliters we know that we have a buffer there where the concentrations of the weak base and the weak acid are equal to each other. 
So if the concentrations are equal to each other, you know, it's a buffer. And if the concentrations are equal to each other, the ratio of acid to base would be 1. Log 1 would be what? 0. And therefore, we know pH equals pKa. All right? So here, <clears throat> even though we have a base in solution, this gives me the point at which pH equals pKa. All right? It's not pH equals pKb. Even though we have an acid down there, some students say, why? We have, an, uh, we have a base down there, so why are we talking about Ka rather than Kb? But remember, pH always equals pKa, according to henderson hasselbalch equation, when the concentrations of acid and base are the same. All right? So here, this would be pH equals pKa. And so, if I, you don't even have to do any calculations. If I ask you, what is the pH at the half equivalence point, you just look at this table and you look for the conjugate acid-base pair that we're interested in looking at, and that would be ammonium and ammonia, and you know pKa is 9.25, so what should this pH correspond to? 9.25, all right, because we know that at the half equivalence point, the pH has to equal pKa. Is that, is that clear to everybody? So now we've looked at all three types of titrations. I did not do any calculations here, but you should be able to do the same type of calculations that we did for weak acid, st strong base, or strong acid, strong base. And I'd like you to try that at home. In fact, I've assigned a problem from your textbook where you get to practice that. Okay? Yes, go ahead. Can you quickly explain what happens at the equivalence point in the volume? So at, her, her question was, <clears throat> what happens at the equivalence point? Okay? So you have to turn to the net ionic equation. So in this titration, what's happening is the strong acid neutralizes the, the weak base, all right? And so essentially what happens is when this reaction takes place, you have NH4 plus and water being formed, okay? So when you have stoichiometric amounts of both or equivalent amounts of both, where all of this reacts completely with this and all of this reacts completely with this so that you have no excess reagent left over, all right? Both reactants react completely. And that happens only at the equivalence point because you have to have stoichiometric amounts. You have to have the, the right amount of, of each so that you don't have any limiting reagent, you don't have any excess reagent, they react in stoichiometric amounts. So that only happens at the equivalence point. Okay, so at the equivalence point, when both of the reactants have reacted completely, all that you have left behind is just the products. You don't have any excess reagent left over. So because all of them have reacted, all that you have there is just NH4 plus, water, and Cl minus. All right, the spectator ion is Cl minus. Cl minus is the conjugate base of a strong acid, and we know that that's neutral. We know water is neutral, all right? And so now we turn to NH4 plus. So those are the only three species in solution. If you turn to NH4 plus, you know that that's a weak acid. It's the conjugate acid of a weak base, and therefore it's a weak acid. If it's a weak acid, it's going to be acidic, all right? And therefore the pH should be less than 7. Got it? Okay, so now we're, we've completed looking at acid-base titrations, and now we're actually ready to move on to the last topic that we're going to look at in terms of titrations. So by now, you guys are experts at solving any equilibrium problem. And we focused, uh, this entire quarter, we focused on um, aqueous equilibria, what happens in water, all right? And that kind of has been the focus all along. Now we're going to look at the last type of equilibria, and this deals with solubility, all right? So we're going to look at solubility product. And as all of you know, solubility deals with when, when a substance dissolves. So we're looking at aqueous, um, we're looking at solubility product in aqueous solutions, and so the word solubility is related to soluble, when something dissolves, all right? So let's take something, as all of you know, we know that many, many ionic compounds dissolve easily in water, and we call them soluble salts. So if I take 
soluble salts. So we'll start by looking at soluble salts. And all of you know when we use the word salts, we're talking about ionic compounds. And we said if you take ionic compounds that are soluble, what happens the instant you dissolve them in water, what happens to soluble salts? They dissolve. And when they dissolve, what does that tell you? They dissociate completely. Okay? So give me an example of a really good soluble salt. In ACL. We all know table salt in ACL is a very good soluble salt. So I start with an ACL. And all of you know that if I take a beaker and I'm going to add solid sodium chloride. So you take, all of you know that um, ionic compounds tend to be crystalline solids. And if you take common table salt, you, you can see that they have nice crystalline granules. And so if you take a spoonful of that and put in a beaker of water and stir it, what's going to happen? It dissolves completely. And when we say dissolves completely, we know that it has dissociated completely to give you Na plus and Cl minus. Okay? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another spoonful and stir it up. It's going to dissolve. I'm going to take another spoonful and stir it up. It'll dissolve. I'm going to keep doing this until the point comes when that solution is completely saturated with sodium chloride. So if I keep putting more and more and more sodium chloride, uh, what I'll end up with is a really saturated solution. At the point at which this gets to be saturated, we know it's saturated because it can't take any more. If you add another spoonful of sodium chloride, it's not going to dissolve anymore because that solution has taken as much as it can take. And therefore, what will happen is you're going to have undissolved sodium chloride at the bottom. So that we're talking about a saturated solution, a solution that can take as much sodium chloride as it can take. And now it's beyond the point where you can't dissolve any more sodium chloride. At that point, you'll have solid material at the bottom. All right? Now when you have solid material at the bottom, what happens is that you will establish an equilibrium where you have Na plus equals plus Cl. In other words, you will establish an equilibrium where when one unit of NaCl dissolves, so one cation and anion dissolves, somewhere else they will deposit. One unit will deposit. Do you see that? So if the solution is saturated, then what happens is you will establish this equilibrium where you have the solid material dissolving and you'll have, if the solid material dissolves at any point, you're going to have two dissociated cations and anions associating with each other and depositing on top of that solid. Okay? And sometimes the solid material at the bottom is called we call this a precipitate. So when you have undissolved material at the bottom, we say we have a precipitate at the bottom. Okay? Now, since this is an equilibrium, we should be able to apply the law of mass action to this scenario, but it turns out we can't because this solution is non-ideal. This solution is non-ideal. All right? And the reason it's non-ideal, it, the solution is non-ideal because it is not homogeneous. And the reason it's not homogeneous is that when the solution is saturated, the saturated solution has mixtures of ion pairs and ion clusters. All right? So the reason that the solution is non-ideal is because, because it's so saturated, now the cations and ions are so crowded, by chance, they're, they're so close to each other that they pair up. So we call that an ion pair. 
So when the solution is so crowded with cations and anions, now in solution you'll have one cation and anion so close to each other that they pair up and you have an ion pair. Or by pure chance, if four of them are together, two pairs of cations and anions will form a cluster. You can have three pairs of cations and anions forming a three-pair cluster. You can have four pairs forming a four-pair cluster. And so what happens is now you have all these different species in there. You just don't have cation and anion separate from each other. On top of that you have a pair paired up called an ion pair. Or you can have a few cations and anions forming clusters and the number of cations and anions in the cluster can vary. So the net result is now you have mixtures of different kinds of pairs and so we say the solution is non-ideal. Your, your solution has to be uniform. Your solution, if you're going to calculate concentrations and you want to determine how much of each species is there, if you have mixtures of all of this, you can have independent separate cations and anions. You can have in that solution not only that, but you can have pairs of ions. All right, just one pair or you can have two, three, four, five pairs of ions clustered together and as a result the solution is no longer homogeneous. All right, and because it's not homogeneous we say it's a non-ideal solution. It's not, an ideal solution is where everything is homogeneous, dissolved completely and all the species are the same. So ideal solution would be just having Na plus and Cl minus and that's it. But if you have clusters and ion pairs and so on, now it becomes non-ideal. So the net result is that the law of mass action cannot be applied. All right? So when you take a salt that dissolves easily in water, a soluble salt, you can't uh, um, solve an equilibrium problem, you can't use the law of mass action because that solution is not ideal, okay? But if you take insoluble, so we're going to call these insoluble salts, okay? Or we call them marginally soluble salts. All right? So incompletely soluble salts, marginally soluble salts. Um, there's another word that we use and I want and slightly soluble salts. So if you say insoluble salts, marginally soluble salts or slightly soluble salts. All right? Now if you take these, they all mean the same thing. So we, sometimes we use the word insoluble, sometimes we use the word marginally soluble, sometimes we use the word slightly soluble. So these are the exact reverse of soluble salts. Soluble salts are the ones that dissolve completely, okay? Everything else falls under this category. And an example of this would be something like silver chloride. Okay, so silver chloride is a precipitate. It's insoluble and the reason it's insoluble is if you place it in water, it just sinks to the bottom. It just forms a precipitate. So now we don't need to form a saturated solution. The instant you put silver chloride down here, it'll form a solid, it'll form a precipitate and because it's insoluble or marginally soluble or slightly soluble, a tiny, tiny, tiny amount actually dissociates. So it's like, this is the equivalent of like weak acids. Remember weak acids, weak bases dissociate only a small amount. The majority of it stays undissociated. The same thing here. So when you take an insoluble, marginally soluble, a partially soluble, um, salt. Now you set up this equilibrium. Now this is an ideal solution. Why? It's not saturated. This is a solution where only a very, very small amount of the silver and chloride dissolve. So in solution they're far apart from each other 
And so there's no chance that you can form ion pairs or ion clusters, okay, because the amounts are so small and they're separated by billions and billions of water molecules that they don't, all right, they don't form ion pairs or ion clusters. And so what you do is you establish this equilibrium where some solid will dissolve and then some of the dissolved material will combine to give you a solid and you would establish an equilibrium and because this is an ideal solution now, we can apply the law of mass action, all right? So since this is an ideal solution, the law of mass action can be applied. All right, so now only in the case of insoluble or marginally soluble or slightly soluble substances, we can apply the law of mass action. And if we can write, uh, if we can apply the law of mass action, then we can write the equilibrium we're going to look at, which is the solid precipitate in equilibrium with dissociated silver ions and chloride ions, okay? Now can everybody see the difference between soluble salts and insoluble salts are their attraction to water. Soluble salts, the instant you put them in water, they dissociate to give you cations and anions because their attraction for water is greater than their attraction for each other. Insoluble, marginally soluble salts, their attraction for each other is much greater than their attraction for water and that's why they form a, a precipitate. They don't dissociate in water, they'd rather stay associated as the solid, okay? So if you look at silver chloride now, we can write, this is an equilibrium, but can everybody see that this equilibrium is different from the other equilibriums we looked at because we have a solid and we have the others dissolved in aqueous solution. When you have two different phases, what do we call that? Heterogeneous. And do you guys remember last quarter when we looked at the basic fundamental concepts of equilibria, when you deal with heterogeneous systems that have pure solids, pure liquids, what do we do? We don't include that in the law of mass action of the equilibrium expression. So in this case, if I were to write the equilibrium uh, expression, which is the law of mass action, we'd say K, and this has a special name, so we call the KSP equals the silver ion concentration times the chloride ion concentration and this has a special name. This is called the solubility product constant. And remember the word solubility is the amount that dissolves, all right? And so you can see product means time. So what we're looking at is the solubility of silver and chloride, the amounts of silver and chloride that dissolve and you're multiplying that and that's what gives you the solubility product. See, this is the solubility of Ag plus, this is the solubility of chloride, this is the product of that and therefore we call it the solubility product constant. Because these are all substances that don't dissolve easily in water, would you expect KSP to be a big number or a small number? small because the equilibrium relies entirely on the solid side. Only very, very minuscule amount actually will dissociate. So all KSP values are really, really small. Remember if the KSP value is large, it'd be like sodium chloride, all right? If KSP is really large, but then we can't apply KSP to soluble substances because the solutions are non-ideal, all right? So we don't apply KSP to soluble salts. We only apply them to insoluble, marginally soluble, or slightly soluble, okay? So if you look at the value for this, this is about 1.6 times 10 to the negative 10. If you were to write the unit for this, you can see this is moles per liter, this will be moles per liter, so it will be moles squared per liter squared, okay? Often, we, even though we know that the equilibrium constant has a unit, very often we omit that unit. Okay, so you should remember that if it had a unit, this would be moles squared per liter squared, okay? And this would be at room temperature, all right? 
Now, if I were to raise, remember we said that the equilibrium constant always depends on temperature. So if you change the temperature, the value of this would change. And so if I raise the temperature to 100 degrees Celsius, now this value would be 2.2 .2 times 10 to the negative 8. Now look at that and tell me, now does KSP, as you raise the temperature, does KSP increase or decrease? Increases. Remember, what does KSP tell you? It's solubility product. It tells you what the solubility is. So as you raise the temperature, what happens to solubility? It increases. It, that means more dissolves. And we know that. If you want to dissolve a substance, you want to increase the solubility, what do you do? You heat it up, all right? And you can see when you heat up and increase the temperature, KSP actually goes up. And if KSP goes up, it tells us that the solubility has increased, okay? Now, if you wanted to know, uh, so let's take some other examples. So if I take another example would be PBI2. This is an insoluble substance. The equilibrium you would set up would be PB2 plus aqueous plus 2 my I minus aqueous. There are two I bins there. So if you look at this formula, when it dissociates, it's going to give you 2 I minus. Remember, in all of these equations, you have to maintain charge balance. So you can see we start with something that's electrically neutral. Therefore, this side has to be electrically neutral as well. Lead is 2 plus, and therefore it's got to have 2 I minuses to balance that. And overall, 2 plus, 2 minus, they balance each other. And if you take the KSP for this, this is of the order of 7.1 times 10 to the negative 9. If you take something like, and so if I wanted to write the law of mass action for this, this would be the concentration of PB2 plus times the concentration of I taken to the power 2. If you take something like aluminum hydroxide, this is also an insoluble substance. The equilibrium you would establish is, now the way to figure out charge balance is to look at hydroxide. What is the charge on hydroxide? Minus one. How many hydroxide are there? Three. So that means you have three minuses. To counterbalance that charge, you have only one aluminum. So what should the charge of aluminum come out to be? Three plus, all right? So you have to figure out what the charge is. In every case, you have to figure out what the charge of your cation is and what the charge of the anion is. Now, usually group one metals, you know, have a charge of what? plus one. What is the charge of group two metals? Plus two. The transition metals are what? Variable. It changes. And so for transition metals, you don't know what it is. And if you want to figure it out, you always turn to the anion. So if you know the charge of the anion, you can figure out what the charge of the cation is. All right? So in this case, aluminum comes out to be three plus and hydroxide, you need three hydroxides to balance that charge, all right? And if you look at KSP, KSP comes out to be 2 times 10 to the negative 32. That's a in tremendously small number. So you can see only a very, very tiny amount of that actually is soluble, or the solubility is really, really small. And so if you want to write KSP for that, KSP would be the concentration of the aluminum cations times the concentration of the hydroxide ions taken to the power 3, okay? So because KSP deals with substances that are insoluble, we know that all KSP values have to be really small. You can never have a KSP number that is greater than 1, all right? Because that means it's a soluble salt. And you can't have a KSP for soluble salts, okay? So here is, um, I pulled this out of a handbook and it's really, really small and it, that's okay because what I really wanted you to focus on is that just like we have tables for Ka values, there are tables for KSP values and usually these are in alphabetical order, all right? And so you can see aluminum hydroxide, and you can see the KSP that corresponds to that. But what I wanted you to take a look at is, take a look at all the KSP values. Can you, can you see that all of these are numbers that are less than one because they're all insoluble 
marginally soluble, are slightly soluble, and they're all going to have really, really small numbers. Got it? So that's important to remember. Another thing that I want you to remember is that one way for you to identify whether a substance is insoluble or soluble is if it has a KSP value that's really, really small. If it has a KSP value at all, it has to be insoluble, marginally soluble, or slightly soluble. Another way to figure out whether a substance, a salt, is soluble or not is to look at the solubility rules. In, in high school, you have seen this before and we call these the solubility rules and this is a guide for you to figure out whether an ionic compound or salt will dissolve in water or not. So another way for you, rather than looking at KSP values, another way to figure out whether an ionic compound or salt is soluble or insoluble, marginally soluble or slightly soluble, is to follow these rules. Now, I don't want you to memorize these rules, but I do want you to be able to understand these rules and if you have the rules right next to you, be able to apply them. All right? So on an exam, if I want you to use this, I will actually provide the rules. I'm more interested in whether you can actually apply the rules rather than whether you are good at memorizing the rules. Okay? So the first rule is that all nitrates and acetates are soluble. So if you take an ionic compound where the anion is a nitrate or the anion is an acetate, so sodium acetate, potassium acetate, all of these will dissolve completely. So the first rule is that nitrates, ionic compounds with anions that are nitrates or acetates are soluble in water. Sometimes we write the formula for acetate like that. Sometimes we write it as CH3CO2 minus. They're the same thing, okay? So CH3CO2 minus is what? The conjugate base of the weak acid, acetic acid. So acetate is the conjugate base of the weak acid, acetic acid, okay? The second rule deals with chlorides, bromides, and iodides. And what we know is all chlorides are soluble except when the cation is silver, when the cation is mercury, and when the cation is lead. All right? So except for those, all chlorides are soluble. The same rule applies for bromides and the same rule applies for iodides. All right? The third rule is all sulfates are soluble. So if your anion is a sulfate, all sulfates are soluble except barium, strontium, and lead. Okay? They're all insoluble. Then they say calcium, mercury, and silver are only slightly soluble. Remember, for all intents and purposes, we're going to say that insoluble mean the same thing as slightly soluble mean the same thing as marginally soluble. It's like categorizing them all as weak acids. All right? Either they're weak acids or strong acids. In this case, they're either they dissolve completely, which are the soluble salts, or the opposite. Okay? Yes, go ahead. Um, what's the S after the C A? Oh, that's a typo, okay? Thanks for pointing that out. Um, all right, it's calcium sulfate. Okay, so that's sulfur, there are two S's there, and can you cross out the lowercase s? Okay? So calcium sulfate. It, uh, mercury sulfate, mercuric sulfate, and silver sulfate are only slightly soluble. The third one is all group one metal ions and ammonium ions are soluble. All right, so if you have sodium, potassium, or if your cation is ammonium, they're soluble in water. All hydroxides are insoluble except group one metal ions and ammonium ions. Barium, strontium, calcium, these are group two metals. All right, barium, strontium, calcium are marginally soluble. The, the, the set of rules are on the class website, so you can print it out, all right? So I put it in. If you look at yesterday's date, I put this up already, so you can print it out. Six is all sulfides are soluble except group one metal ions and ammonium. Calcium ions, strontium ions, and barium ions are uh, also insoluble. F all phosphates and carbonates are insoluble except group one metal ions and ammonium ions. Most chromates are only slightly soluble except those of group one metal ions and ammonium ions. Okay? So, what I, so this covers almost every anion or cation combination that you can come across. All right? 
Now what I want you to keep in mind is there are some very rare instances where you may have two rules that give you kind of, it's very, very rare, that two rules will give you opposite information. All right? If that does happen, then what you have to make, keep in mind is any rule on top has precedence over any rule at the bottom. Is that clear? So it kind of goes in that order and if you encounter, it's very, very rare, it's very unlikely you're going to encounter it, but if you ever encounter where two rules kind of give you conflicting uh, information, then always make sure that anything on top takes precedence over anything below. Got it? So either you can use KSP values or you can use solubility rules to figure out whether an ionic salt is soluble or not. Okay? So now we can, now that we understand the difference between soluble salts and insoluble salts and that why we focus only on the insoluble or the marginally soluble or the slightly soluble compounds, now we're ready to look at solubility and KSB. All right? So we want to look at the relationship between solubility and KSP. We said before, if the KSP gets bigger or any substance that has a KSP that has a bigger number, we know that's related to solubility. So that means that substance will be dissolving a little bit more than something that has a lower KSP. Okay? So solubility refers to the amount of the substance that dissolves. Okay? So if we want to look at solubility, and let's take an example of silver chloride. So we know silver chloride dissociates to give you silver cations and chloride anions and we know this equilibrium is given by KSP and the equilibrium constant is a really, really small number. Now we want to calculate what is the solubility, how much of this actually dissolves, all right? To do that, we don't need to go through the complete ice chart because you look at, you usually use the ice chart where you look at the initial, then the change, and then at equilibrium if you need the initial concentration. Now if you look at this, do I, am I interested in the initial concentration of silver chloride? It doesn't dissolve in water anyway, all right? It doesn't appear in the law of mass action. So all I'm interested in looking at is what do I have at equilibrium? Can everybody see at equilibrium, if I look at the concentrations, we know that if negative x dissociates, we know plus x plus x would form. So at equilibrium, all I'm left with is just that, x, x. Can everybody see that? So all I'm interested in is the amount of silver and chloride at equilibrium and since they dissociate in a one-to-one -one stoichiometry, that's going to be x. All right? So I know that KSP equals 1.6 times 10 to the negative 10, which gives me the silver ion concentration times the chloride ion concentration, which is x times x, which is x squared. Okay? So if I take the square root of that, I end up with 1.3 times 10 to the negative 5 moles per liter. <clears throat> Now this is the amount that dissolved. Remember? This is the amount that's consumed. This is negative x and the amount that's so. Since this is in moles per liter, we call this molar solubility, all right? Or in general, solubility. And this gives the amount a concentration of AgCl that dissolved. All right? Remember, solubility is related to how much actually dissolves, how much is soluble. And therefore, it, when you talk about molar solubility, it gives us, that in terms of concentration, the amount of the starting material that dissolved, okay, which is X. Now, sometimes it's customary to give this as gram solubility. So if you want to give this in terms of gram solubility, so here, this is molar solubility, 
and if it's molar solubility, the unit is moles per liter. All right? If you give it in grams solubility, you want to know how many grams of the solid material actually dissolve. All right? And so if I want to convert moles to grams, what do I need to do? I need to multiply by the molar mass. All right? So I start with 1.3 times delta negative 5 moles per liter and I'm going to multiply by the molar mass of silver chloride. So you go look at the molar mass of silver, the molar mass of chloride, add them together. That gives me 143.3 grams of silver chloride per mole. So this is the molar mass. This is times the molar mass of AgCl, which is the reactant because solubility refers to the amount of the reactant that dissolved. Okay? So you can see moles and moles will cancel out and so I end up with 1.9 times 10 to the negative 3 grams per mole of AgCl. So you can calculate solubility in terms of concentration and that is X, that's the amount that dissolved, that would be molar solubility or you can calculate in terms of grams and that would be gram solubility. Oh, I'm sorry, grams per liter, yes. All right, so the unit would be grams per liter, uh, grams per mole would be the molar mass, got it? So let's apply this um, in a problem. So. Let's take a very straightforward and easy problem and so if we take this example where the solubility product constant for calcium fluoride is given to you, okay? Calculate the concentrations of calcium and fluoride in a saturated solution of calcium fluoride at 25 degrees Celsius and determine the solubility of calcium fluoride in grams per liter. Now here they're using the word saturated and when you talk about insoluble substances, saturated refers to just the teeny tiny amount that will dissolve, all right? When you talk about soluble salts, if you use the word saturated, it means that it's super, super saturated. Do you get it? So that's the difference. So you should be able to recognize from the KSP that it's 10 to the negative 11 and so this is an insoluble substance so very little actually dissolves and when when the maximum amount that can dissolve is dissolved, we call that a saturated solution, but the maximum amount that an insoluble salt dissolves is going to be really a minuscule amount. Got it? So we're looking at calcium fluoride, so we're going to set up the equilibrium. So we know this is insoluble and we're looking at KSP, so the, The equilibrium that you're going to establish would be this. Calcium is group 2, so it's got to have 2 plus. Fluoride is group 7, it's got to have minus 1 charge. There are two of those. And we know KSP equals 3.9 times 10 to the negative 11. That number is going to be really, really small. That means that if I want to calculate, I know KSP, if I want to calculate the concentration of calcium and fluoride, I know at equilibrium, if X is consumed, how much calcium would form? X. But if X is consumed, how much fluoride would form? 2X. Okay, so don't forget that. And therefore, we know that KSP equals calcium ion concentration times fluoride ion concentration raised to the power 2, which is X times 2X squared. All right? Make sure you put this within parentheses because if you take 2x squared, that becomes 4x squared times x, what would that give me? 4x cubed. So we know that x, uh, 4x cubed, sorry, 4x cubed should equal 3.9 times 10 to the negative 11, which is KSP. Therefore, if you work out the uh, value of x, it comes out to be 2.1 times 10 to the negative 4 moles per liter. So X is solubility. This is molar solubility. This is the amount of solid that dissolved, okay? The first part is they want us to calculate the calcium ion concentration. So therefore, the calcium ion concentration is actually X and that would be 
times 10 to the negative 4 molar. If you take the fluoride ion concentration, the fluoride ion concentration would be what? 2x and therefore it should be 4.2 times 10 to the negative 4 molar. Now lastly, they want you to calculate the solubility of calcium fluoride in grams per liter. So now we want to calculate gram solubility and that would be the molar solubility which is 2.1 times 10 to the negative 4 moles per liter times the molar mass of calcium fluoride. So look at the periodic chart, calculate the molar mass of calcium plus two fluorides and if you add them up the number comes out to be 78.1 grams per mole. Moles and moles are cancel out and this is a calcium fluoride. Okay? And therefore, what you end up with is 0 0.016 grams per liter of calcium fluoride. So the gram solubility gives you the mass of calcium fluoride that actually dissolved per liter. Okay? And that we figured out. Okay? So, Next class, we're going to take a few more examples of solving equilibrium problems associated with KSP. All right? So we'll stop there for today.